Hi, everybody. So we're up to uh, section 2.5 of chapter 2, and uh, we're going to talk about truth tables. We've seen them a little bit in the case of and, or, and not, um, but they're a very useful tool for figuring out what's going on with more complicated compound statements. So um, by a compound statement, I mean uh, something like if A, then B, or C, or if A or B or C, then D, or other statements which are made up of uh, complicated internal structure like you get on income tax forms. If the amount in box 32 is bigger than $2,000, or you have completed form C, then you must either complete form SE or provide a statement indicating why you are not required to do so and sometimes it can be a pain to figure out what's going on there. So uh, let's look at a more concrete example. Uh, so let's say I say to you that um, if you get an A on the final or you get at least 90 on the homework, then you're gonna pass this course. And let's assume this statement, I mean, what does it mean to say that this statement is true? It doesn't, the statement, it's not a question of whether or not you pass the course. The statement is true if the professor here is telling the truth, meaning that if this condition is really the case. So as we've discussed, if you, if you don't get an A on the final, then it doesn't tell you whether you're gonna pass the course, right? So how can we break down all of the possible uh, permutations of a statement like this? And that's where a truth table can be helpful. So um, let's first of all, pick apart the statement. There are three pieces to it and I've labeled them P, Q, and R. So the first piece is you'll get an A in the course. Uh, the second statement is you'll get an A on the final. And the third statement is you get at least 90 on the homework. And the professor's promise is if Q or R, then P. So remember, that means if you get an A on the final or you get at least 90 on the homework, then you get an A in the course. So what are the possibilities in this situation? So I've, here I've written the, um, the statement using the symbols. Remember that the V symbol, which is like set union, means or, and the arrow means if, then. So this is a fancy way of writing if Q or R then P, and that was the pr professor's promise. So there are three possible statements that make up this statement, Q, R, and P, and they can each individually be true or false. So um, how many, what are the, all the possibilities? Well, if you think about it, we have to assign T or F to each statement. So we want to count sequences T, T, F, or more generally, we want to count sequences of length three with T or F. And this is a, um, a fancy way, I mean, one, a fancy way of looking at that is that such a sequence is an element, just to remind you of things that we've already talked about, of the Cartesian product of the set TF with the set TF and the set TF three times. Right, because this Cartesian product is precisely the set of ordered triples where the first element is true or false, the second element is true or false, and the third element is true or false. True or false. If we call this set S, then we know from our previous work that the number of elements in the set S is two times two times two, which is eight. And the way we can um, figure out what those sequences are is by working through all the possible ways of choosing 
either a T or F from the first one, a T or F from the second one, and a T or F for the third one. So if we were going to write those out, we can pick a T from each one. We pick a T from each of the first ones, and then we pick F from the last one. We Now we pick a F from the second one. And finally, we pick an F from the first one. And all together, we get eight possibilities. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now, if we want to figure out what's going on with the statement Q or R implies P, let's make some subcalculations. Let's first figure out Q or R. Well, Q or R only depends on the first two columns of my table. And remember that R, that OR, just requires one or the other of the two statements to be true for it to be true. So since they're, since um, Q and R are both true here, it's true. It's true here. Here Q is true. Here Q is still true. Here R is true. Here R is true. But here they're both false. So at the bottom there, those are the only ways in which Q or R can be false, is if both Q and R are false regardless of what happens with P. And now we can work out what happens with Q or R implies P because the rule there is that if Q or R is true, let's remember what the, what the implication is just for reference. If A implies B, here's A and here's B, true, 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 false, 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 true, true, false, false, true. So an implication is false only when the Q, Q or R is false, is, is true, and um, P is false. So if we compare these things, here we have true. This is the case where Q or R is true, but P is false. So here this implication is false. Here it's true. Here it's false. Here it's true. Here it's false. And uh, since Q or R is false here, it's true in both of these cases. So um, that's our, um, our truth table. Let's see if we can make some sense out of, uh, let's say, some of these falsehoods here. So um, for example, what's going on here? Let's look at this row. So in this row, if you remember what P, what P, Q, and R are, let's look back at the previous one. Q is you get an A on the final. Let's use a better color. A on final. R is 90 on homework. And P was A in the course. So in... In this situation, what's happened is you got Q or R is true. In fact, you got an A on the final and a 90 on the homework. And yet, nevertheless, you did not get an A in the course. Well, if you look back at what the professor promised, the professor promised that if you got an A on the final or you got at least 90 on the homework, then you pass the course. And here's a situation where you got both an A on the final and a 90 on the homework, but you failed the course. So the professor lied. And that's why we have a false here. What about, um, what about this, this row here? Just to look at another example. So what's going on here? Here, you didn't get an A on the final, because this is false. But you did get a 90 on the homework. And you did get an A on the course. So the uh, professor told the truth because he said, if you get an A on the final or a 90 on the homework, then you're going to pass the course. And in this case, that worked out. You did get a 90 on the homework, and that was enough to get an A in the course. Okay, let's look at one more. Let's look way down here at the bottom. So what's going on here? What's going on here is you didn't get an A on the final, 
you didn't get a 90 on the homework and you didn't get an A on the course. And yet, nevertheless, the statement is true. And that's because, again, the truth or falsehood of the statement isn't about whether or not you pass the course. It's about whether the professor was kind of telling the truth about the conditions for passing the course. And since you neither got an A on the final nor got a 90 on the homework, there was no guarantee that you were going to pass the course. The professor didn't promise that. And so the statement is true. And if you look right above here, you see the situation where you got a, you didn't get an A on the final and you didn't get a 90 on the homework, but you did get an A on the, a in the course, and it's still true. And that's because the professor didn't say that you, you can get an A in the course only if you get an A on the final or a 90 on the homework. He just said that's sufficient to get, a, to, to get an A in the course. So you must have done something else that was enough to get you an A on the course. Perhaps you were very uh, diligent about coming to office hours or you had a particularly sad story. No, never mind that. So uh, as you can see, there's a lot of information uh, about even a situ simple situation like this stored in this truth table. Here's another example. Uh, this is taken from the text. So. The, the, uh, the statement that you're asked to look at, and again, we're using these fancy symbols more or less just to get practice, is P or Q and not P or Q. So I've written it out here using P or Q and not P and Q. And what would the, um, what would the truth table for this situation look like? Well, we only have two statements here. There's only P and Q. So there are only four possibilities for P and Q. They can be both true. One can be true and the other can be false. Or they can be both false. But to work out the whole thing, we have to kind of take this apart into pieces. So we're going to have to look at both P or Q. And we're going to have to look at P and Q. So let's figure out both of those as part of this uh, calculation. So if they're both true, P or Q and P and Q are both true. If one of them is true, the or is true, but the and is false. And if they're both false, both and and or are false. Now we have not P and Q. Well, not P and Q is what happens when you reverse P and Q. So it's false, true, true, false, corresponding to the opposite of what's going on with and. And then to put it all together, we have P, oops, P or Q and not P and Q. So here we have to combine this, whoops, wrong, uh, wrong tool. Let's use the highlighter. We have to combine this column and this column with an and. because that's what we have here. So an and is only going to be true if both are true. So here it's false, true, true, false. So let's think about what we've got here. We've got, uh, if we compare the first two columns and the last one, we see that our combined statement is true when the two statements are different and false when they're the same. And this is an operation which is sometimes called the exclusive or. So it's the exclusive or because it's like or, it's true if P or Q is true, but not both. We sometimes use this in English uh, as a version of or, uh, but to distinguish it from the regular or, it's called the ex exclusive or.
Here's another example. Um, it's similar to the first one, but uh, it involves a biconditional statement instead of just an implication. So it says uh, in symbols, P if and only if Q or R. Uh, and here are two examples of statements of this form. One says x, y equals zero, that's P, if and only if x equals zero, that's Q, or y equals zero, that's R. And the second example is you will pass this course, that's P, if and only if you get an A on the final, that's Q, or you get at least 90 on the homework, that's R. So from a logical point of view, both of these statements have the same logical structure. And as in the very first example now, we have eight possibilities. One, two, three, four, five, I missed one. Oh, I missed false, false, false. So there are eight possibilities. And again, we can work out the, um, let's work out the Q or R part of it separately. So we're only looking at the last two columns. This is similar to what we did the first time. Remember, if either of the second two columns is true, then the or is gonna be true. Oh, I made a mistake here. True, 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 false. True, false, true, true, false, false. False, true, true, false, true, false. False, false, true. And false, false, false. So, um, so this is wrong. This should be a true. Because one of the last two is true. Great. And then we have P, so now we need to do P if and only if Q or R. So again, we're looking now at the first column and the Q or R column. And the rule that we're interested in is that if and only if is true if the two are the same and false if they're different. So let's just quickly remember P, Q, P if and only if Q, the truth table is It's true whenever the two are the same. It, it's, it catches whether they have, the, whether it, P if and only if Q is true if the two are the same, if they're both true or they're both false. So we have to look and see, are they both true? Yes, both true, both true, not both true, not both the same, not both the same, not both the same, both the same. So you notice there are three cases where it's true and three cases where it's false. And let's just think for a minute about what these are. So for example, if we pick um, this row here, what's going on here? So uh, in the first case, this says that, so P remember was the statement X, Y equals zero. So this is the statement X, Y equals zero, right? And Q is the state, and then Q and R are both false. So X is not equal to zero and y is not equal to zero. And that can never happen. So um, the statement is false. I mean, there, there's maybe something to think about here. The, um, and that was maybe why I picked these two examples. So let's, let's table that for the moment. And then also let's look at the other, the other case. So this is the, also the case where um, you pass the course, that's true. And then if and only if, but you didn't get an A on the final. And you didn't get 90 on the homework. So these two statements are kind of false in different senses. The, the fact that it's false as a logical statement means that um, this as a promise is, is not is a lie. The whole statement together is a lie, regardless of whether the individual statements are true or false. And you see that in this case because uh, it certainly could happen 
in the real world that you pass the course without getting an A or you without getting 90 on the homework. And that would mean that this statement that the professor made is a lie. And so this, the statement, the logical statement, the compound statement is false. But the first statement as a mathematical statement is never, it, it never happens that there, there, are, there are no X and Y. Uh, at least in the integers or in the real numbers where this happens. So um, the difference between the two statements is in the set. The second one is a real statement. The first one is really more of an open sentence. It has variables in it. And the truth or falsehood of it of the statement doesn't have anything to do with where the the, um, the variables might happen to be. But as a matter of um, kind of real life experience, if you were working with X's and Y's that were limited, for example, to the real numbers, uh, then this would never happen. So for example, if we were to, to define a set A to be the set of X pairs X, Y in let's say R2, such that XY equals zero and X is not equal to zero and Y is not equal to zero, which is the case that corresponds to this row here. A is the empty set because uh, you can't have such a thing. How, however, there are other mathematical systems in which there this set might not be empty. Um, so uh, you have to be a little bit careful when there are variables in the statement. And it, it, I guess maybe the other thing to think about is it's, it's important to distinguish between uh, what it means to say that a logical thing like this is false. That depends on the values of the individual statements. Whether or not that can happen in real life is a whole other question. Uh, and here we have one, one final example, uh, which is taken from the homework in that section, which is to write a truth table for P and not P or Q. And um, here we only have two statements, so it's easy to write down the possibilities for P and Q. And if we do the components, P and not P, well, P and not P, if you think about that for a minute, that can only be true if both P and not P are true, and that can never happen. Because if P is true, then not P is false, and if P is false, then not P is true. So this is always false. So it's always false, so P and not P or Q um, is true, well, we have to compare these two things and it it's an or so it's going to be true if one or the other is true but this one's always false so it really just depends on q so the the, the point about this is this is always false so the truth of or falsehood of this is the same as q you've added no information by it. so in other words if i were to tell you um the statement is, it's raining, or it's raining, um, and it's not raining, or I own a puppy. Then that statement is going to be true only depending on whether or not I have a puppy. <laughs>